Merci à tous de votre présence, d'être encore nombreux aujourd'hui pour assister à cette conférence. Bienvenue à Patrice Bain qui va nous offrir donc ce, ce moment. Merci aux enseignants, aux équipes de direction, à tous les personnels de nos établissements de répondre présents à chaque fois pour ces conférences. Merci aux parents d'élèves également, à nos élèves lycéens, bref, à toute la communauté éducative de la mission d'Aïe française et plus largement donc à tous les invités qui étaient prêts à échanger comme lors des, des trois précédentes conférences que nous avions suivies depuis le début de l'année scolaire. Je rappelle que le thème général de ce cycle est de repenser l'école ensemble. Nous continuons donc aujourd'hui à faire avancer le débat après les défis et les richesses des classes multilingues, après les mythes urbains à propos de l'enseignement et de l'éducation, après un passage également par une neuroscience affective, place donc au Powerful Learning for Home and School. Merci, merci beaucoup, François. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, Patrice is actually going to introduce herself at the beginning of her presentation, so I won't get into her background and expertise, but I will say how grateful I am that she's with us today and willing to share her expertise with us. And I'll just share that I think the power of what Patrice has to offer is that she is a teacher and she is a teacher that partners with researchers, cognitive scientists on powerful learning, the science of learning. And this is where we can really have an impact for students in the classroom and our children at home. I know many of you are parents here with us today. So with that, I will just say once again, thank you, Patrice, and welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining all of us today. If you should have any questions, please go ahead and type them up in the chat box. We're going to be having a live Q&A at the end. So please, let's answer any questions you have. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hello, I'm Patrice Bain, and thank you so much for joining me today as we discuss powerful learning for home and school. You have access to a retrieval card. There will be times where I'm going to pause and have you write down a takeaway that you may have had, strategies that you'd like to implement, a question to ponder, a concept to deep dive, something I mentioned, I'm going to start doing that, or, oh, I'm not going to do that one anymore. You know, I've been doing that and now I know why it works. So this is your retrieval card. Remember, I'll be giving you time where I will pause, allowing you time to write. Let me start with my very long and winding road. I started teaching way back in the early 1990s. At that time, we didn't know as teachers too much about learning. We were taught how to teach, but we really weren't taught how we learn. Most of that information was tucked away in journals in jargon that was really difficult for us to understand. And most of the research had been done at universities, with college students, in laboratories. Well, in 2006, two cognitive scientists from Washington University in St. Louis, Dr. Mark McDaniel and Dr. Henry Rodiger, had a novel idea. What if we researched how children learn in an authentic classroom? Well, they got a large grant 
and started the research in my classroom with my students. How fortunate for me to be the first in the United States where this research began. In 2007, I was the only K-12 teacher invited to work with the Department of Education to work with cognitive scientists in looking at the research, what was the research and what would have most impact on teachers. That was written up into organizing instruction and study to improve student learning. Also from Washington University to my classroom came Dr. Pooja Agarwal, and we worked together daily. In 2019, we wrote the book, Powerful Teaching, Unleash the Science of Learning. And in 2020, I, pub I published The Parent's Guide to Powerful Teaching. And here we are talking about how to empower that teaching triangle between student, parent, and teacher. When we work together, it is powerful. I really like this quote by Daniel Willingham. Children, are more alike than different in terms of how they think and learn. To me, that's pretty profound. So whether you go to this top school in your district, in your city, in your state, in your country, or not, whether you speak English, or not, children are more alike than different in terms of how they think and learn. Today, we are going to be talking about those very ways that make children alike in learning that we can start implementing right away. So what is powerful teaching? Powerful teaching takes the latest in what we now know based in research and combines it with evidence gathered strategies that we know boost learning and knowledge retention. And for me, it started every first day of school by saying, I'm your teacher, and I'm going to teach you how to learn. Why? Because every year, second quarter, as soon as the grades have come out, I would have students come up to me and say, Mrs. Bain, I have a B or I have an A in your class. And just as enthusiastically, I would say, I know, but their demeanor would change and they would say, but I never get good grades. I get D's and F's and follow it with, I'm not smart. I would muster up my enthusiasm again and say, but look at you now, and what is the only difference? The difference is now you are learning how to learn. We know better. We know how our children, how our students learn. We can do better. It is time to stop having our students internalize failure when they don't do well, but instead learn the basics of learning, the strategies that allow learning so they internalize success. I 
conducted a national survey in the United States and I asked to parents and I asked what are the top two things that would help you with your child's learning? Ponder that. What would you, how would you answer that? Were those on your list? Understanding how we learn too often because we've been students, because we've been through school. We think, well, I know how to learn, but we now know how to make learning more effective and more efficient. And we know specific methods and strategies that will help our children, help our students study. So let's get back to the basics. How do we learn? There are three basic steps, encoding, storage, and retrieval. Encoding means getting information in. As teachers, we excel in this area. We know our curriculum and we have dozens, if not hundreds of ways of getting that information into our students' heads. Parents sometimes think encoding, storage, retrieval. I didn't attend a teacher prep program. What do I know about encoding? So much. Because parents have been encoding since that baby was born. By the time children attend school, they already have so much knowledge in their long-term memory that has been encoded at home. Family lore, skills, beliefs, values. Parents and teachers are experts at encoding. Encoding, step one. Step two is storage. We put it in and there it is, right? Mm, not so fast. As my co-author, Dr. Pooja Agarwal says, often we focus on getting information in. What if instead we focused on getting information out? And that gets us to the third step, retrieval. Encoding, storage, retrieval. Do you have a takeaway? Do you have a question to ask me at the end? Something that you might want to pursue a little bit? I'm going to give you about 45 seconds to jot anything down on your retrieval card. Go. Thank you, let's go on. This is retrieval. Whenever we bring forth memories, we are retrieving. For the most part, we really enjoy it. Thinking about, oh, that fun vacation we were on, that great restaurant we went to, family times. This is retrieval. 
So why is this often a look that we get from our students, from our children, when we ask them to retrieve? Why does it bring forth anxiety? We know why. Anxiety comes when retrieval is infrequent and it's for high stakes. If we teach something to our students at the beginning of September and it's not revisited until a semester exam, retrieval was infrequent and it's high stakes. Instead, what we aim to do is use retrieval throughout the course of study, allowing our students to retrieve, to pull forth this information until it is in our long-term memory. We asked 1,500 high school students does retrieval practice make you more or less anxious for unit tests? How do you think they answered? Predictions? And why? Because when you practice retrieval, Throughout the course of study, you are ready for exams. And when you're ready for exams, anxiety lessens. I want to talk how research shows us that we can increase learning through power tools. But what are power tools? Power tools are principles that have been heavily researched that we know, we know increases learning and knowledge retention. The three I'm going to discuss are retrieval practice, spacing, and feedback driven metacognition. They're so powerful we call them power tools. And why do we love them? They're not a fad. With over 25 years in a classroom, I sat through many professional development days. And too often they were based on anecdotes and fads. Not these. These are based in research. We know because of this that they boost long-term learning and social-emotional learning. We know that they work for most content areas and ages. Research goes down to three years old all the way to well, here we are now. We know they've been used in so many subjects, disciplines, from French to Spanish to history to science to math to firefighters to medical school, law school, they work. But best yet, how simply making a small shift in what you're already doing will make a big difference. Time for 45 seconds again. Takeaways, something that made you curious, something to start, stop, or keep. You've got 45 seconds.
Thank you. And let's go on. So we've talked about the power tools, retrieval, spacing, metacognition. Let's learn specifically more about them. The first one, retrieval. My definition, pulling information out. Let me discuss a study we did that very first year in my classroom. We wanted to see, does retrieval make a difference? So Dr. Agarwal and I devised how we were going to do this study. What we did was we took a look at what information did I want my students to know by the time we finished a chapter, a unit, whatever. What did I want them to know? Now we took this information and Dr. Agarwal took some of this information and used retrieval throughout my six different classes. Some retrieved some information, other classes retrieved other information. But while this was happening, I was not in the room. So I was never into finding out what was being retrieved and what wasn't. I taught my class the way I normally would. And then I gave a chapter exam, normal chapter exam. I graded it as normal. But Dr. Agarwal would then take the information from that exam and take a look at what had been retrieved versus what hadn't. And we can see that simply by using retrieval throughout that chapter, throughout that unit, made a big difference. An 81% to a 94% simply by retrieving. This happened chapter after chapter, unit after unit. So then we came up with another idea. We thought, what if we gave a big test at the end of the year, over the entire year, but we didn't announce the test because we didn't want anyone to study. We truly wanted to see, does retrieval work over the school year? Now, to be fair, because it was unannounced and they did not, could not study for it, it also did not go in the grade book. But what about that final test? Without any study whatsoever, my students remembered 79% of what had been taught without any study. I liked that. So how can we retrieve? Remember, it's pulling information out. Well, we know what it's like when our children come home and we say, so how was your day? We know what kind of answers, and usually retrieval is not part of it. Simply asking instead, if we were to paint your room, how would we know how much paint to buy? Think of the knowledge a person has to know in order to answer that question. There's information to be, to be retrieved. Or tell me today's history story in Spanish. Why do you suppose a science experiment turned out like that? Where did you go in geography today? Describe it in French. Taking questions and simply asking why 
and how encourages retrieval. Have some fun with it. Here was a uh, comic strip from February 25th, Garfield. Show it. Now, how would you translate this into Spanish? How would you translate it into French? Anytime you are having someone retrieve, you are creating strength in what they know, stronger knowledge, boosting that knowledge retention because it makes it stick into the long term memory. And I like this too. Just because you see something doesn't mean you know it. Do you happen to use any Apple products? If you do, no fair looking right now. But tell me, which is the Apple logo? middle column on the top. Or here's another example. Think of a coin that you regularly see. What if you were to sketch it? Do you know where the date is? Do you know what it says? If there's a person on it, what are they wearing? Which way does he or she face? Even though you may have seen something hundreds or more times, just because you see it doesn't mean you know it. Why do I bring up these examples? Because too often we encourage ineffective study strategies. Oh, reread that chapter. Oh, look over your notes. See where you highlighted? Read over that. Even the language that we're using, just because we see it, doesn't mean we know it. We need to be able to retrieve it. And I always like to show this to my students, the responsibility diagram. As teachers, as parents, we encode information. We know what information to get into the heads of our children, of our students. But it is only the student who can retrieve, not Google not friends, not parents, not teachers. It is only the student who can bring forth, who can retrieve the information. Time to ponder. and time to write. We just discussed retrieval. A takeaway? Something you want to ask me at the end? Something you want to start, stop, keep? You've got 45 seconds.
Thank you. Let's discuss the second power tool, spacing. And how do I define spacing? But spreading retrieval over time. You know you've taught your students something. You know you have taught your children something. And you ask them later, and you get those looks. It's happened to me. I think it may have happened to you. There is a reason why this happens. And it's forgetting. And that's okay. Forgetting is an absolute part of learning. So much so, there's something called the forgetting curve. As soon as we learn something, we've got it. And then we start forgetting it that fast. Well, here is what's called the forgetting curve. It helps see how often we should retrieve information, how often we should spread out that retrieval. So if there's something that we really, we're going to need to know this for a test, we're going to need to know this for whatever, 24 hours after you learn it, do a quick retrieval. It doesn't have to be a major test. It could be a simple, what I call a blast from the past, simply asking a question. What were those three steps of learning? Encoding, storage, retrieval. Ask your child, bring back a question the following day. And three days later, go ahead and ask it again. And then maybe in a week, and then maybe a couple weeks. Because each time that we have someone retrieve this information, we are strengthening the pathway to that memory. Truly, they get stronger with repetition. And we can space it out. That's why we call it spacing. Until finally, the students have it. I remember teaching in sixth grade world history and having students when they were in college write to me and say, Mrs. Bain, my professor started talking about Charlemagne and I knew exactly who they were talking about, that he was crowned in the year 800 by the Pope. When we use retrieval and space out that retrieval, the memories stick. The third strategy, principle I want to talk about is feedback-driven metacognition. And how do I define it? But discriminating what we know from what we don't. Have you ever studied your child has studied, your student has studied. They studied hard and they are so ready for the test. And as you are grading the test, they didn't do well. Again, there's a reason why this happens. It happens because human nature, we tend to study what we already know. I know this, I know this, I know, oh, I don't know that one. I know this. And it builds up an illusion of confidence. Because we have studied what we already know, we think we're ready. But as we all know, there's more on a test than what we think we know. 
what happens is frustration. Parents are frustrated when they saw their child study and not do well. Teachers are frustrated, but mostly students are so frustrated. I put in the time, why didn't I do well? And what eventually happens, they quit putting in the time. We know how to change this. In a little bit, I will be discussing strategies that you can use at home that will guarantee your students are studying, your children are studying what needs to be studied. You know the drill. You've got 45 seconds. Thank you. Let's discuss tips for home. A designated spot. This helps with learning. Now, if you do some type of hobby, most likely you have a place where you go to to do it because it has your tools, your supplies, the space. Students, children need a designated spot where their tools, where their supplies, where what they need is. Your house, your family, what designated spot works best in your house? The one thing you want to make sure that it's a place where distractions are minimal. Routine is so effective. But you decide your own routine, what works for your family? Do you do homework right after school? Do you take a break and have a snack? Whatever works for your family. Just make sure it's a routine. And let's discuss multitasking. Because we can't do it. We may think we are we are the expert in multitasking. Look at me, do this and that and this all at the same time. But research shows we really are not good at multitasking. In our brains, located right around here, it's called our working memory. And with new knowledge, we can take in on average four to seven items, new items of learning. We need to focus. But what happens if we're studying and we hear ping, our phone goes off and we look at our phone. Oh, I'm just going to check. Oh, okay. It takes us a bit of time to get back to that section in our working memory where we were before. Research has shown that when we attempt to multitask, what happens is it takes us longer to study, 
and the grades are not as good. How do we get around that? Create a routine. Spend, and again, this totally depends on the age of the child, five minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, whatever works for the child, and then stop, give a break, check the phone, do this, do that. Then go back for another set time where your working memory is not disturbed. And let's discuss some strategies for home. Now the site is on your retrieval card. If you go to powerfulteaching.org and go to the resources tab, there are templates for you to download that you can use right away at home. Let's go over what some of them are. Years ago, I developed the four steps of metacognition. And why did I do this? I did it because my students were studying what they already knew. And I knew I needed to come up a way to have them figure out, discriminate what they know versus what they don't. Take a few moments and read through these four steps. And now let me show you how these work in action. I used to give flashcards, you know, you look up, here's the term, and you look in the back of the book, and you write ver verbatim, and you're done, and you don't know what anything means. I found that happening. I thought, I need to get my students to retrieve. So I switched from flashcards to retrieval cards. And let's go over the four steps. Without any notes or books, you make a judgment of learning called a J-O-L. Do I know it or not? If you know it, put a star, happy face if they're younger. If you don't, a question mark. Go through all of them. Just doing step one. Step two, answer all the you know. Step three is the first time you open your book, your notes, and now write down what the answer is. And step four, verify that what you thought you knew, you did. These don't have to be graded. The work is already done. But what I liked best is students had already made that judgment of learning, that discrimination of what they knew versus what they didn't. So when it came time to study, they knew where to concentrate. I also created what I called metacognition sheets. Let me explain it before you take a look at it. There are items to know, along with the four steps, do you know it or not? Answer those that you do, look up those that you don't, verify those that you do. Now, taking a closer look, the top two, Maximilian Robespierre, definition of revolution, these were items actually from my classroom. Simple recall, definition, term. But then I also have, how did each revolution change the lives of working people? How did the social pyramids change as a result of the revolution? I was able to put in critical thinking questions. Now, my students knew that just because something was on a metacognition sheet didn't guarantee it would be on a test. They knew I might be spacing out information. Now, on my strategies, you will find I use power tools, I use retrieval, I use spacing, 
and I use metacognition. Now, again, you can go to the site and download a blank sheet. So how would you use this at home? As you do homework, what was something really important that the teacher really emphasized today? Write down the term or a definition under items to know, and then put it away. Next night, write down some more things. Three or four days before your big test, you automatically have a metacognition sheet right there to help you figure out what you know and where to focus your time. Retrieve taking. When reading a book, notes at home, mainly a book, pause and close the book. Take some notes then. Retrieve and write down your notes. Then open the book and start reading again. Younger children may be a paragraph. Older, a page, several pages. I would also use this in my class, retrieve taking, where I would be discussing and then I would stop. I've done that with you today with your retrieval card. Why do I do this? Because I know what it was like to be that student who tried to write down every single thing that my teacher was saying and my notes were a jumbled mess at the end. Did I get everything? I don't know. I gave you time. I have given you time where you could stop, think, and retrieve rather than taking notes while I talked. And finally, for fun emoji retrieval, pick out an emoji. What was something funny that happened in French today? What made you curious in history? Was there anything that confused you in science? Have some fun in having your children retrieve. You've got 45 seconds. Retrieval, are you using it? How can you incorporate it? Spacing, spreading retrieval over time. How might that look now? Metacognition. Are there strategies in place that lead to efficient and effective learning that help discriminate what we know from those areas that need the work? Thank you so much for having me today. And I look forward to your questions. So are we ready to go? Start asking away. And thank you. Euh, alors, Hélène, est-ce que, et j'imagine que oui, nous avons de nombreuses questions posées à Patrice dans le chat ou peut-être euh, directement? Yes, absolutely. You can uh, drop your questions into the chat. We have a couple already. I think Patrice is ready to go with those. And as Francois said, feel free to unmute yourself as well uh, with any questions. 
Patrice, uh, thank you, Patrice, and I pass it to you. Thank you. Uh, we had a question um, about kinesthetic learners. If someone tends to learn more efficiently using actions versus auditory hearing or visually, let me first go back to that children learn more alike than different in terms of how they think and learn. Research shows that we tend to learn, it, it's kind of classified into neuro myths and neuro truths. Neuro truths are ones based in research. Neuro myths are often based in fads and anecdotes, and there is no research to back them up. When we talk about learning styles, kinesthetic, visual, auditory, that's actually, and I know a lot of people are surprised to hear this, but it's a learning myth. There is no research that backs that up. That being said, what are some ways that help our students to connect? Now, even though, I would use the three steps, encoding, storage, and retrieval. I would add things to my teaching, such as mnemonics or different ways to help my students remember things. I might be doing something, snapping a rhythm or singing a little song. What happens is sometimes you can you can help connect students with something in their long-term learning that will help them remember. But I think one of the most important things is to remember that children learn kinesthetically, kinesthetically visually, and auditory. They use all three. A danger can be if students think that they tend to learn one way over others because they will tend to dismiss the other methods. Just make sure that learning is rich in all three. I hope that answered your question. Uh, another question was, what if parents think, okay, that sounds rather simple and straightforward and I'm already doing this. You might be surprised at how often I have heard those words from both teachers and parents. But my answer usually reflects upon, are you doing them purposefully and intentionally? such as retrieval, we might be asking our students about certain things, but are we really making sure that they are retrieving information? Are we spacing out that information? Remember I discussed the forgetting curve, where as soon as we learn something, we start forgetting it. So making sure these things that we want our students to get into their long-term memory, that we ask them to retrieve, to space out, to retrieve over time. So take a look at how you are doing things with your children. Are you able to incorporate retrieval and spacing? and giving them the tools to figure out, ah, I know that, or I don't know that one. Let's focus on those that you don't know. Uh, let's see, another, oh, go ahead, Ellen. Ellen, you're muted. Uh, uh, yeah. Got it. Go. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of other questions. I'll, I'll sneak them in there. I did translate them in the in our personal chat, but let me uh, throw one out there. So how do we help students get the right information out at the right time? 
What a great question that is. I, I think kind of a mantra that I use is the more the better. You know, if you wait to have a student retrieve something over a week, it's going to be much harder for them. They will have forgotten a great percentage. You want to be able to retrieve, but each time they retrieve, then you can space it out farther. So what you want to do is just simply make sure that you are retrieving, you're spacing it out. Don't wait too long or they will forget it. If you wait, just make sure they retrieve again and start doing it more frequently at first. But like one of the examples I gave, when I taught students in sixth grade, year six, they were about 11 years old, that I had retrieved it enough throughout the year that they could still retrieve this information years later in college. Our goal is to get what they're learning into long-term learning. We can, we can remember so much. It's unlimited in that area. So that's our goal. And I know, I know we're at time. So if people have to drop off, of course, that's okay. But Patrice, if you're open, I can feed you a couple more questions and we'll get it on the recording. Yes. Is that okay? Um, so I'll just read. And excuse me just a minute, Ellen. Yeah. For those that, of you that have to uh, get off because we're at time, thank you so much for joining me. Okay, Ellen. Thank you for that. So I'll just read it as written. So would you say metacognition is the student's intellectual introspection at the moment of learning? Will you read that to me one more time, Ellen? That is quite a definition here. Would you say that metacognition is the student's intellectual introspection at the exact moment he is learning? Actually, I would not for my definition. To me, metacognition is when students have the ability to retrieve information and that knowledge of I know it or I don't. Now, chances are, in fact, there's research that shows if you are quizzed immediately after learning something, you will most likely remember it. But that's not when we usually give tests. That's not usually the best way to learn. Instead, what we want to do is give time and allow students then to figure out what they know and what still needs work. To me, that is metacognition. Students being able to make that discrimination between what they know and what they don't. Thank you for that. Here's another one. Do you not think that in order to use the retrieval method, school programs and teaching must be adapted? Yes, it should be adapted. It is, uh, Retrieval is one of the most important, researched, effective, efficient ways of learning. What is best is that so many of us do it, but not maybe according to the, the best ways to do it. For example, being able to retrieve 24 hours, retrieving in a week. So adapting in a way that just aligns with what science tells us works. Does it take money? No. Does it take extra time? 
Research also shows that doing retrieval, conducting retrieval exercises throughout a course of study lessens the amount of time used for review before big exams. So it's free, it doesn't take extra time, it can be done in a car, around the dinner table, at breakfast, it can be done anywhere, anytime, and we know it is effective. Should we adapt in order to incorporate? Yes. Thank you so much. To be respectful of everyone's time, I think we'll leave it there. But thank you for your questions, everyone's participation, and big thanks to Francois for opening things up. And Patrice, of course, thank you for your expertise and, and generosity of spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much Merci for having Hélène. me. Merci, Patrice. Ben, merci, Hélène. Peut-être juste rappeler que ce cycle de conférence se poursuit et qu'après la conférence de Patrice Bain ce soir, nous nous retrouverons dans un peu plus d'un mois, le vendredi 6 mai à 18h. Notre sujet est de nouveau des conférenciers en anglais. Alors, je vais essayer, Hélène, de le dire en anglais. Reimagining, teaching, learning and schooling avec deux conférenciers. Will Richardson et Omar Tavanga seront à donc moi, merci à tous et surtout merci infiniment à Patrice Bain pour cette conférence. Bonsoir.